Okay, if I could have your attention, I'd like to get uh, started with our next talk, continuing our afternoon session. So our next speaker uh, is Tom Kepler. He's a professor of microbiology at Boston University School of Medicine. Uh, he's also director for the Center for Computational Immunology located at Boston University with ties to Duke, uh, which is again one of the centers for modeling immunity for biodefense. He got his BA at the University of Massachusetts in Boston and a PhD from Brandeis University. Uh, he continued some postdoctoral work at Brandeis and then also postdoctoral studies at the Santa Fe Institute. Uh, he then uh, was at the Department of Statistics at North Carolina State University for a number of years, and then the Department of Biostatistics at Duke prior to moving uh, relatively recently to Boston University. Uh, and in the Kepler Laboratory, they developed computational tools, applying them in the context of systems level experimentation, again, that common theme of relating experiment and computation, uh, and trying to address questions in immunology, vaccine development, uh, and in conjunction with partners at Duke and Harvard Universities, they developed a new approach, approach uh, to vaccination that applies some computational methods, and it has to do with uh, driving affinity maturation and so on. And I suspect that some of what we'll hear about today uh, as he talks about analysis of antibody and clonal dynamics. Tom, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thanks, Dave. It's, it is great to be back in Blacksburg, my son, uh, got his undergraduate degree here, and, and he's uh, a big fan of uh, Virginia Tech, and I think that he will be for the rest of his days. Yeah, he really enjoyed himself here. Yeah, I'm, I will be talking about affinity maturation and the computational tools that we've developed to help understand affinity maturation with the ultimate goal of helping us to induce affinity maturation in the context of vaccines. And the structure of my talk is going to really be a series of vignettes, more than a single coherent presentation from beginning to end. And that gives me the advantage that if I run out of time, I can just chop off the last vignette. And that does happen from time to time. So I'm going to go over the background that you're going to need to understand uh, to appreciate what we've been doing. And in fact, I'm going to go back into the history a little bit more than is usual, simply because I, I, I really enjoy it and I hope to convey that sense to you. Then I'll describe the statistical methods that my group has developed uh, to help us understand affinity maturation. And then I'll go through three specific examples of where we use these methods. Uh, one is in looking at the response to an experimental influenza infection, looking at the B-cell response. One is looking at uh, the evolution of a so-called broadly neutralizing antibody against HIV-1. And then finally, uh, still looking at HIV-1, we'll begin to look at the role of insertions and deletions in addition to simple point mutations. And um, we'll start by going back into the history of it. So one of, one of my dreams or, or my long-term goals is to put together um, a model of a particular system, a biological system, in which the model is able to grow organically as new knowledge is acquired. And I think that the best way to begin thinking about how to do that is to, is to understand historically how knowledge has grown in a particular field, to understand what changes were wrought by individual discoveries and individual experimental results. And imagine if you had been trying to put together um, a, a dynamical systems model, your whatever favorite kind of model you have at the time, what would the model have to have looked like in order for it to have grown organically from that point? And so uh, I'm going to just go through just a couple of, 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 of pieces of background that you would have had to see anyway, only I'm going to try to put it into the context in which it was first discovered at the time. So please 
bear with me for this minor indulgence. I went the wrong way, because I'm looking at the wrong machine, actually. I'm <clears throat> So I was, I was going over the overview in my mind. You weren't seeing this. I was seeing it there, so I apologize. Um, I'm going to give you another five seconds to look at it since you haven't seen it before. <laughs> Two, one, and so now on to the background in history. This is um, the front page of a German uh, a medical journal from 1890, and in this journal, Von Behring and Keith Sato report some interesting results that they acquired um, with rabbits immunized with Texas, Texas, with tetanus toxoid. And so it's, it's, it's really simple experiment, but it's exceedingly beautiful. They immunized a rabbit with tetanus toxoid. So tetanus toxoid is just a sort of a slightly less uh, lethal form of tetanus toxin. And the rabbit was thereafter protected from tetanus infection by the organism and by intoxication by tetanus toxin. That was already well understood. But what they did next was, was much more interesting. They took serum from the rabbit, the immunized rabbit, injected it into an unvaccinated rabbit, and lo and behold, the other rabbit was also protected from infection and intoxication. So what they had shown was that there was something in the serum of the first rabbit that conveyed protection to the second rabbit. And so what they had done was isolated a protective factor that uh, we would then go on to uh, discover uh, or antibodies. At this time, of course, that wasn't known, but subsequent experiments showed that you could protect rabbits against virtually anything through the same procedure. And also, if you immunized against pertussis, then um, it wouldn't protect against tetanus and vice versa. And in the, in the subsequent decades, it was found that you could make antibodies to just about anything. And so the next question arose is, how, did you, how are you able to encode such specificity? They thought there must be thousands or millions of different specificities. How is that possible? And that was not discovered until almost 100 years later, 1978, when Susumu Donagawa studied the immunoglobulin uh, loci. Well, they weren't loci at the time. He had transcripts and looked to see where the transcript hybridized to in two different kinds of cells, an embryo cell and a plasma cell, a cell which had already by that time been known to make antibody. And they found that the hybridization patterns were quite different. And from that, um, they deduced, Sonagawa deduced, that what was going on was that the, there were two segments in the gene and that they were separated in the, the genome, but then the cells that would go ahead and make antibody would join these two gene segments together to make a complete antibody. And of course, that's now uh, what I think is truly the hallmark of adaptive immunity, is the ability to recombine receptors. And of course, we've learned a lot more about that. I keep going back to that one. Um, and of course, for heavy chains, which is what I'll be talking about for the most part, for the remainder of the talk, not only are there V segments and J segments, but there are D segments as well. And so just to refresh, to make an antibody heavy chain, you pick a, J, a, a V segment, a D segment, and a J segment, stochastically, not completely at random, there are biases, and you make a complete heavy chain VDJ rearrangement. Now, in addition, we'll and this is something that we'll just have to bear in mind for what is to come, there, are, there is further stochasticity in the exact location of the place where each of the gene segments is cut. And, just 
to make it all the more interesting, there are non-templated nucleotides that are polymerized into the junction. Okay, so altogether we have com combinatorial diversity in the selection of the gene segments. We have diversity in the location of the individual recombination points. And we have diversity in the insertion of, of non-templated or N nucleotides. We'll come back to that momentarily. So, <clears throat> Uh, this, the cells that bear, well, that make and bear uh, these molecules, antibody molecules, are called B cells. And what's interesting is that uh, in 1965 and 1966, Max Cooper um, was studying the B cells and T cells in chickens. And what Max discovered was that if you cut out the thymus of a chicken, you would lose a lot of the functioning of the immune system, but you didn't lose antibodies. And if you cut out the bursa of fabricus of the chicken, you would lose antibodies, but not a lot of the other stuff. And so, in so doing, he really laid out the grounds for separating the two lineages of B cells and T cells. And of course, now we know that they have to cooperate with, it, with each other, so that the antibody is worn as a receptor on the B cell. And of course, remember these uh, receptors are created stochastically, and so they have a great variety of different binding sites. Once they do bind their ligands on, for example, a bacterial surface or on the surface of infected cell or whatever it is, um, they process the uh, antigen presented to T cells, and then there's a mutual signaling that activates the B cell, and the B cell then differentiates to become a, a plasma cell, perhaps, or a memory cell, we'll talk about that in a minute, and then the, the B cell secretes antibody of the same type. So it's a very clever system. And then the antibody goes on to serve several different important functions. Now, even before we understood how rearrangement occurred, it was noticed in just about the same time that Max Cooper was figuring out the difference between B cells and T cells, that if you immunized a rabbit, rabbits played a big role in the early days of immunology, apparently. If you immunized a rabbit with uh, an artificial haptic and then measured the affinity of the serum antibody for that haptin complex over the next few weeks, something really extraordinary happened. And that is that, and I'm just pointing out one specific row, but all the rows tell a somewhat similar story, um, the affinity of the serum for the haptin goes from one at two weeks, six-fold higher to 5.9 at five weeks, and then up to 250 in eight weeks. So this affinity is growing really substantially. And it's really quite an extraordinary story. And we had no idea what was going on at that point. But we knew that the affinity was changing. And so Herman Eisen called it affinity maturation. 20 years after that, we started to understand how it worked. And this was work done in Martin Weigert's laboratory. He was again looking at light chains. And at this point, uh, sequencing was becoming uh, more widely used. And so he sequenced a handful of uh, kappa genes. And what he s discovered in trying to make sense of what he saw is he, he noticed that the genes differed from each other by just a few point mutations. And in fact, you could build a phylogenetic tree. Oops. You could build a phylogenetic tree um, from uh, the sequences that he recovered. And, and so he said, this is really strong evidence, as far as I'm concerned, for the introduction of mutations during the course of the immune response following immunization. In other words, we immunize, and then the genes that encode the antibody molecules go through a series of steps in which mutations are introduced and 
he had no evidence for it at the time, but he said it must be that these mutations that introduce higher affinity antibodies confer an adaptive advantage to the B cells that bear them. And so that's how affinity maturation works. Point mutations and then selection. And that turned out to be quite right. And now we know uh, very clearly that affinity maturation through these processes is really the key to getting a good vaccine response. And so here's an example from uh, a laboratory of colleagues with whom I was collaborating at the time at Duke. Uh, what we did was uh, immunize mice with a protein from Bacillus anthracis called protective antigen, or PA. And um, we measured the affinity over time, over a three-month period, um, either, uh, so this is whole serum, either where there was no immunization, where there's immunization with the protein alone, or immunization with the protein plus a potent adjuvant. And we were finding that the affinity rose more rapidly and, and ultimately reached higher levels if you used an adjuvant. And so what we're interested in really is understanding how we can drive this higher affinity response through means like adjuvants. Why do we care about affinity? It turns out that high affinity typically means better function. And here again is, a, is, a, is data from the Sempowski alum group at Duke. Um, what they did was they, from the same uh, system that we were looking at, they took serum, they measured the uh, average affinity in the serum, and they looked at uh, the neutralization capacity to the ability to neutralize uh, lethal toxin in macrophages, and they found that the higher the affinity, uh, the better the neutralization. So that's, the, that's basically the story. High affinity, good. High affinity comes from somatic mutation and selection. How do we get a hold of those processes to drive the kinds of responses that we want? That's what this is going to be about. And so, I've set up the background. Now I'm going to do some of the math, some of the statistics. And then this workshop is about modeling. And you have to make sure that you don't blink to miss the model in the talk. Because my model is a statistical model. Okay? It's, it's genuinely a model for reasons that I'll, I'll describe. But it, it's not long sets of differential equations. I, I do those too, but what I'm going to talk about today is a more subtle kind of model. It's a statistical model. And so what we need to do is to account for two different sources of variability in immunoglobulin genes. The first source is in the initial rearrangement process. The stochastic process gives rise to a given initial gene. And it's that gene that the naive B cells have when they first pop out into the periphery. And that process is called rearrangement. So um, we have to have a model for rearrangement. And then we have um, a somewhat more complicated model for evolution by somatic mutation. And when I put these together, I'll have a model for the process of affinity maturation. Although. As some, some key features will be left out for another grant proposal. So let's talk about the arrangement process itself. Remember, we, there are a very small number of things that you have to tell me, and I can tell you what the, what the resulting gene looks like. You have to tell me what the V gene segment is, the D and the J gene segments. You have to tell me the places where the segments are cut, and then you have to tell me what nucleotides you've, you've put into the junctions. And so, uh, this is uh, a, a gene, a heavy chain, human heavy chain gene that we've got in one of our uh, anthrax vaccine studies. And we've got it broken down um, into the, the maximum likelihood configuration. So, in other words, what we do is we estimate parameters, just like any other statistical uh, estimation procedure. And in this particular case, it says that the result was that the most likely choice for V gene segment is a V gene segment called VH1-3 
star O1. And it looks as if the, um, the V gene is cut one position from the end. And you can you say that because you notice that all of these positions match. The dot indicates a match between the observed sequence and the germline VH gene segment. But it doesn't match here. So we figure it, it, this is probably where it's cut. And you, you know, it's possible, of course, that it actually was originally encoded by this nucleotide, and so this was an A, but it mutated. It's possible. But it's less likely. And similarly, um, the best um, reconstruction, the best estimate, says that all of these nucleotides come from N nucleotide addition. And then similarly, uh, the D gene segment starts here. There's a mutation in the middle, another mutation here, a short N region, and then J starts here. So that's what you have to do. For every one of these things, you have to estimate um, the best rearrangement. Trouble is that the second best rearrangements are often, are, are often not that bad either. So here's another example. So the next two best rearrangements have the same uh, five primed N, but down here, this, this one says, well, um, the place where D is cut is actually a little bit deeper. And when you do that, then this is no longer a mutation because it was originally encoded by D. And you pay for it by saying, I have to have more N nucleotides, and, and so forth. And so what we're going to want to do is to account not only for the top scoring rearrangement, but for all of them. And to do that, we're going to use Bayesian statistics. And if you aren't familiar with Bayesian statistics, the basic idea is don't just try to find the best parameter set, but average over all the parameter sets. And in general, if you don't know something, average over everything, weighting it by the probability that it's the correct one. That's Bayesian is in, in a nutshell, and that's the way we're going to be uh, proceeding. So here's an example of a case where it seems absolutely essential to use Bayesian procedures because the best possible rearrangement, the best possible story for how this antibody gene came about is, is not much better at all than the second best and so forth. So this is the same kind of, same kind of um, diagram showing the V, D, and the J aligned underneath the observed sequence. This sequence is called VRCO1. And you see, it's just really hard to decide where the, where the recombination points are. And therefore, it's going to be really hard to decide exactly what this gene looked like before it acquired these mutations. Why do I care? Why do I make a big deal out of VRCO1? Well, VRCO1 is currently the most potent and most broadly neutralizing antibody against HIV-1 that we know of. Um, it is 32% mutated at the nucleotide level. This is an extraordinary level of mutation. And what this tells us, well, in, in addition to all, all of the other broadly neutralizing antibodies that we've found, they all have a high level of mutation. What this tells us is that affinity maturation plays a key role in the development of broadly neutralizing antibodies against HIV. And this is why we have to study affinity and maturation all the more intently if we're going to make a good vaccine against HIV. So it's, it's an important antibody. It's clearly driven by affinity and maturation. But unfortunately, we can't really study the process in this antibody because all of the mutations that it has acquired have essentially completely obscured its history. So this one, in spite of its importance, is going to be very difficult to study. And it, and it tells us that we have to do um, much more careful statistical modeling than perhaps people might have thought. So the second part of the model, we've done rearrangement. We have a model for rearrangement. It seems just completely trivial. You just pick a bunch of parameter values, and, and that's your rearrangement. The next part is a little bit more interesting, and the next part is genuinely dynamic. It's a Markov model for the introduction of point mutations. And so um, 
we're going to take each column in the alignment, every nucleotide position, as independent of all the rest, which is what one typically does in phylogenetic uh, statistics. And the key part of our model is going to be um, a function that gives the probability that a nucleotide in state A for ancestral, after, after a passage of T units of time, will be observed to be in state N. Okay, so A goes to N after a period of time T, and it's a probability, and it's very straightforward. We, there are a number of different models that you can use, um, depending on the level of complexity that you want, but, but this is all there is. Now you put all of these together, string them side by side along the entire length of the, of the molecule, and that's your model. So putting it all together, we have a model for somatic hypermutation and for rearrangement. And now we've got uh, an interesting extension of the methods that people have used for many decades, well, for 20, 30 years, um, building maximum likelihood phylogenetic trees. So uh, the basic idea is that I've got three sequences that I believe belong to the same clone, that is, the same B cell was stimulated and divided and mutated along the way and made three uh, descendants that differ from each other by mutations. And we build a phylogenetic tree showing how they're related and then what we want to do is to guess what the original form of the ancestor was. That's what, we're, that's what the first part of our procedure is going to be. What was the original ancestor? Look, what did it look like here? Well, um, if I'm just doing maximum likelihood and I've got a, a, a bunch of proteins that I'm trying to decide their ancestor for, we have no constraints on what the ancestor might be. And so for... Um, a gene of, of length 300, it's an astronomical number of possibilities. But if it's an immunoglobulin, the interesting thing is that the same setup gives you only about 10 to the 12th different possibilities. Because there are only that many different immunoglobulin uh, unmutated rearrangements that can occur, roughly speaking, with the appropriate probabilistic weighting and so forth. So, uh, what, what we thought of as an extraordinary, and people use words like nearly, limit, nearly limitless or nearly infinite uh, diversity of immunoglobulins, turns out to be an extremely small subset of all possible uh, amino acid sequences, which is a really, really great thing for us. That means that we can actually run through all of the possible ancestors here and do a complete probabilistic uh, Bayesian inference and decide which ones make the best ancestors. And that's exactly what we do. And you notice that we can do that for whole sets of clonally related sequences by these techniques. And that's going to be the key. So here's an example. I won't dwell on, the on, on, the, um, on this example. This is a clone that was published a few years ago. And so we, we took these sequences and, and re reconstructed the clonal um, ancestry of it, and this is uh, impossible for you to see, but I, but I know that there are just a couple of things that, that I want you to see. This is the region called CDR3, complementarity determining region 3, which forms uh, a crucial part of the antigen binding domain. And what we're looking at here is the estimated error at that position. And so, in CDR3, we have a, a few positions where the error is around 15 to 20 percent. And these positions tend to be places where we are undecided about whether a position was originally encoded by a D gene or by an N nucleotide. So we've got this kind of slot. Here, this error is 50 percent, and this is due to allelic differences. So there are two VH genes that encode the observed clonal sequences equally well, but they have allelic differences that we can't resolve on this data alone. And so 
um, these remain. Point here is really just to point out that um, there really are residual uh, uncertainties that need to be resolved, and we'll come back to that in a little bit as well. So here's our VRCO1. This time we're looking at it again. This CDR3, and there are four possible nucleotide states: C, T, G, and A. And what I'm showing here is at each position the posterior probability that the nucleotide state is given by each of these four. And so here, this is the invariant cysteine, this is the codon for cysteine, and this must be here. And so we have TGT, and they're bright white, we have very high um, um, confidence that these are correct. And in fact, we know that they have to be correct or else it wouldn't have made it an antibody. But then here in the middle, of CDR3, we have a great deal more uncertainty. And so if we're trying to understand the history of this antibody, we're going to be in deep trouble because we can't reconstruct it at all adequately. But there are those that we can reconstruct because we have better information and the antibodies themselves have lost far less information over the course of their evolution. And this is one study uh, of a clone called 2569 that was obtained by Tony Moody and his collaborators from Duke in a study of experimental influenza infection. So this study was conducted in the UK. I don't know whether it could be done in the United States or not. They had volunteers who uh, agreed to inhale uh, live influenza. And they got sick. And seven days after they got sick, they gave blood samples. And antibodies were recovered from these blood samples. Genetics was done. And then they gave these antibody sequences to me for my processing. And so out of a few hundred of these sequences, we found several sequences that appeared to be clonally related, that is, have descended from the same initial B cell. And there was one that uh, allowed us to infer the history particularly well, that is, with high confidence. And so we studied this one. And um, this uh, technology is no longer quite as cutting edge as it was two years ago when I started uh, talking about this work. But, but it's still, I think, it's impressive. And if you think about going back to Kitasaro and von Behring, how far we've come in, in technology. Here, we're taking individual B cells, putting them one B cell at a time into individual wells, and then cloning out the heavy chain and light chain from single cells simultaneously. And so, um, what we end up with is a light chain, heavy chain pair for each of these individual B cells. Then we can transfect these B cells into cells that make um, the antibody, and we can study the properties of those antibodies as a pure protein system. It's a monoclonal antibody at this point. But the really cool thing, as far as I'm concerned, is this is all based on sequence. They get the sequence, then they make the, the vectors, and then they make the antibodies, which means that I can put anything I want to into the vector. And in particular, I can make my phylogram the way that I described, and starting with the five observed sequences, I can also infer what the ancestor looked like and what the intermediate antibodies looked like by their positions on the tree. I can run my evolution backwards or between these two, and I get very good inferences for these, and so I can make all of these antibodies. So, um, Larry Liao at Duke um, synthesized the antibodies that our group inferred, and Munir Alam computed or measured the affinity. And what we found was that if you plot the dissociation constant, which is the inverse of the affinity, against the evolutionary distance measured in expected substitutions for position, you have a very nice 
linear regression in the log of the dissociation constant. In other words, over the course of this evolution, the affinity is rising exponentially and doing so at a very consistent rate. And I thought this was a really remarkable uh, finding that, that it was so continuous in its pace. The other thing that's really interesting is that what we ended up with is five different sequences, all of which had pretty good affinity. And if you look back at these, the sequences that we've got here, they're very different from each other. In fact, they are... Oh, I guess I don't have that here. Sorry about that. Um, they differ from each other by several amino acids each. And I'm sorry that I don't remember the exact numbers. So there are five different solutions to this problem. The other thing that we can do is to look and see where the mutations accumulate. And this is going to be the, uh, the most taxing part of the presentation. So if, if, you, if your attention is going to wax and wane, I, I think it should wax right here. Okay, pay attention just for two slides. Because um, this there's so if you haven't worried about somatic mutation before, this will be sort of different. So let's focus our attention here first. This is a histogram along the length of the heavy chain and along the length of the light chain. And this is just a histogram showing where the mutations fall. And this is showing where the mutations fall by evolutionary distance. So each of these uh, observations occurs at a given distance and we put the mutations in where they appear. And so we've got these interesting patterns and we ask, well, do they correspond to anything? Well, here's something that's important about somatic mutation. Somatic mutation is introduced um, non-uniformly along the length of the immunoglobulin gene. There are certain places in the gene that get mutated much more readily than other places. And it has to do with the nucleotide sequence that binds the enzyme AID. AID is the enzyme that is responsible for making the initial lesions in the DNA that then cause mutations to occur. And so where, A, where AID is more likely to bind, that's where you're more likely to have mutations. And so, what we're, what we're showing here is the, the plot of where AID is more likely to bind compared to the average. So the average is zero, and in places where the lines go upward, this is where AID is more likely to bind. Where they go downward, it's where it's unlikely to bind, where there are hot, uh, cold spots. So this is sort of temperature, if you like. More likely to mutate, less likely to mutate, and these three regions here show where the complementarity determining regions are. These are the regions that encode the parts of the antibody molecule that actually bind the antigen. And so you see that the first two CDRs seem to be, you know, a good bit hotter than their surroundings. CDR3 not so much, and interestingly there's a, there's a, a region here in what's called framework 3 that seems to be fairly um, mutable in spite of the fact that it doesn't bind antigen. And now let's look at the observed distribution of mutations and you see that it pretty much follows these uh, the natural tendencies of the mutator. And what we're looking at here is uh, is both um, expressed and synonymous mutations. And this is this uh, histogram is for expressed mutations only. And in particular, you look here at framework three, these mutations are accumulating here even though they're not likely to be playing a role in antigen binding. So it's, it's a sort of a strange thing. So then we can ask the question, why do these mutations have these patterns? Why do they fall in CDRs and not in the frameworks? And this is a question that I and others have addressed in the past, 
And you know, the answer is basically that is that these sequences have evolved so as to put muta mutable nucleotides in places where they might do some good. And where they're likely to do harm, they've made the positions less mutable. And this is by manipulating codon bias, codon usage. So there are, if you need a particular amino acid like serine here, then what you're going to do is you're going to find the least mutable serine codon you can to put it there. If you need serine here, you'll use the most mutable codon. And so that's what's happened over evolution. But now that we've got a specific clone and we can measure the affinities and so forth, we can ask an even more pointed question. If, I've, if, I'm, if I'm starting at a, a particular position in sequence space, okay, here, here's my antibody gene in sequence space. And I, what the mutation is going to do is to move me around in this sequence space. And I move, this, of course, there are discrete jumps from one nucleotide to another at a particular position. And so if I have 300 nucleotide long sequence, then for, for many position, there are 900 different places I can go. So um, I'm going to move around in this space. And question is, for this particular antigen, influenza HA, do my good antibodies fall on these preferred tracks, the high-speed trains, or to, to get to the high-affinity antibodies, do I have to take the high-speed train to a particular location and then take a local to get there? So what we're going to do is we're going to ask, do the, does the system stay on these preferred mutational pathways, is it sufficient to take only the mutable changes? And the answer is that it is. It's sufficient to take the most mutable pathways only. And uh, this is uh, a cumulative distribution of mutations as a function of the predicted mutability. Oh, you know what I'm doing? You have, you have to see what this is because this is something that only a PhD in physics would do. Okay, see this? If I press this, then I get my, my, my pointer. I was putting my finger over there because it's very comfortable. It's meant to do that. <laughs> Perfect. And I'm pressing and going, the battery must be dead. <laughs> Um, predicted mutability versus cumulative proportion. And uh, this line in the center, this magenta line, tells you where the observed sequence would fall, the observed evolution throughout the entire tree would fall if there were no selection. And this tells you where it would, well, same thing, same thing over here. This is the accumulation of synonymous mutations, and this is the accumulation of non-synonymous mutations. So um, the point here is that the, that the synonymous mutations are actually falling above this predicted line, and the non-synonymous are falling slightly below. So this is our first hint that we're staying on the superhighways or the high speed lines, and but it's only suggestive. The real answer comes from doing um, real modeling, and so this is where the real modeling comes in. And I won't belabor this, but this is the, the appropriate statistical model for mutations of type T with given gene, G, position, I, and so forth. And we measure the probability of having a mutation there by saying, what's the probability of getting a mutation there in the first place? And that's what all of this mess is. The, the subscripts are required because 
if you're going, if you're moving in the in the tree, it depends what your ancestor is. So from node to node, you need a different index, unfortunately. But anyway, for, for the the probability that any given nucleotide will be mutated is the product of the probability that it will be mutated to start with times the probability that it will be preserved in selection. And going through all of this, we can show um, clearly that the high affinity solutions that we have all fall right on the superhighways. That, that it, it would seem that this antibody is pre-set to find good antibodies for influenza. Now, there are lots of caveats there, and we're going to be studying the same um, kind of process for other antigens. But the, the main take-home lesson here is that uh, affinity maturation works really well. And I think part of the reason it works really well is that one never has to explore the entire huge genotype space. We are restricted to exploring a very small subpart of that space, but by some remarkable evolutionary design, we only explore, we are restricted to the space where the good solutions are going to be found anyway. Okay. Okay, now your attention may wane. Okay, <laughs> because the rest of this is going to be relatively straightforward and won't be quite as abstruse as all of that. This is going to be um, much more direct. So we're interested in broadly neutralizing antibodies against HIV-1. And at the time that we wrote this paper uh, two years ago, there were about 56 broadly neutralizing antibodies that had been isolated from patients. And we were uh, interested in some of their properties. And as I mentioned before, if you look at the per percentage of mutations in these antibodies, we find that um, the, the most mutated of them all, such as VRCO1, uh, are up around 36%. Then there, but there are plenty of others, 32%. 32%, 32%, um, and the very lowest of all is 9.3%. The, the average is around 20% or so. And if you look at the mutation frequency in a random collection of heavy chains, in this case it's 37,000 heavy chains that we downloaded from GenBank, the mutation frequency histogram looks like this. And this mark where you, can, where, where you can't see any more bars is at 16%. See, so broadly neutralizing antibodies start at extremely high levels and then go way, way off to the end. Again, um, telling us that affinity maturation is a really key uh, process. So, um, what my colleagues at Duke did, um, spearheaded by Larry Liao uh, and Barton Haynes at the Duke Human Vaccine Institute, they used the same techniques that I mentioned before, this sort of single cell isolation. Um, only they did it, in this case, on cells that had been sorted for uh, capacity to bind the envelope protein on HIV. So um, they found four antibodies that were related to each other clonally. They called them CH104, 103, 106, 105. And they had nice broadly neutralizing uh, properties. But, and I did the reconstruction, I found the unmutated common ancestor, but you notice how far away these antibodies are from this uh, unmutated common ancestor, and that's because the mutation frequency of these guys is about 14%. It's pretty far away. And so I couldn't really be sure of what that unmutated common ancestor was. And so what we did was we made primers that would pick out uh, antibodies with the appropriate V gene and J genes, and went in and did high throughput sequencing on the same patient from whom these broadly neutralizing antibodies were uh, obtained. 
And that means that we were able to recover all of these other antibodies, antibody, well, heavy chain genes, and fill out this phylogenetic history much more carefully. And, of course, we had to identify which genes were really clonally related, and that's another story. Um, but the point is that once, once we have all of this information, we were much more able to reconstruct the unmutated common ancestor appropriately. Now, you, you can, this is color-coded by sampling time. So, um, blood samples had been taken over a two-year period in this individual, actually three-year period, and so what we can see is that these broadly neutralizing antibodies had an ancestor. It was, just, it was very close to the unmutated continent ancestor, so it just had a few mutations in it that already appeared at 14 weeks post-viral transmission. And this is really important because um, these guys were not isolated until more than two years after transmission, and it has been um, regarded as, uh, you know, a given truth that broadly neutralizing antibodies don't arise until much later on. Well, and that's also true for this person, but their predecessors are there very, very early in the beginning. So we can now study this whole history in the same way that we studied the history of the influenza clone and learn a great deal from it. So uh, let's just look at the binding affinity here. So again, we're looking at the binding affinity. The unmutated common ancestor has actually fairly good binding to um, the virus that was transmitted to this individual. So we were able to sample virus and antibody at various time points. And the original form of the antibody, which we inferred, binds to the original form of the virus. Good. And then as the antibody uh, evolves, its binding strength becomes greater and greater and greater until, it, until its binding becomes quite tight. And furthermore, its binding to a virus that it has never seen before also rises quite substantially. So that by the time we're out here with the observed antibodies, not only is it binding its own autologous virus very well, it's also binding an unrelated virus very well, so that it's acquiring both potency and breadth during the course of this evolution. And now the final part of this is to look at the role of another component of somatic mutation. Again, Thinking about these HIV-1 broadly neutralizing antibodies, not only do they have very high levels of somatic mutation, nu nucleotide substitution, but it turns out that they also have lots of insertions and deletions. And it's known that somatic mutation is capable of generating insertions and deletions, but un usually they come at a very, very low frequency. So about 1% of all somatic mutations are insertions or deletions. Um, and if you look, if you pull antibodies at random from a person or from a database, you get about 1% of antibodies also give you insertions or deletions. But among these broadly, broadly neutralizing antibodies, um, the frequency of insertions and deletions is more like 50%. And so they seem to be playing an important role here as well. And now our question is, what is it? What we're going to do is we're going to look um, at this class of antibodies as a whole, characterize them, then we're going to be looking at high throughput sequencing of patients who've been followed over many years, and then we're going to look in detail at this particular broadly neutralizing antibody called CH30 dash, well, CH30 through 34, there are five antibodies, and they have a, a rather remarkable 27 nucleotide insertion. So this is an example of the kinds of events that, we're, that, I'm, that I'm telling you about. This is the observed sequence for one of the broadly neutralizing antibodies. This is alignment to its, um, its unmutated 
uh, V gene, you can see first of all that there are lots of mutations, but second of all, there's this big deletion. So all of this was deleted. Here's an insertion, uh, and here's another insertion. So these things just uh, occur all over the place. So we wanted to ask two questions. What's the frequency? Why, why is the frequency uh, so large? And there are a couple of different possible answers. One of them is that people who end up making broadly neutralizing antibodies have some host factor that predisposes them to both things. Predisposes them to making insertions and deletions, but also to making broadly neutralizing antibodies. And if that's the case, we as vaccinologists are kind of in trouble. Because we can't, it, we can't give the host factor to people who don't have it in order for them to make broadly neutralizing antibodies. Other possibility is that HIV infection itself induces insertions and deletions. And the other possibility is that there's nothing at all unusual going on. And this is just uh, a natural occurrence that, that happens when the immune system is stimulated over and over and over again for years and years at a time. And so um, we did a study using high throughput sequencing of 75 subjects who gave up a total of 261 blood samples and we looked at 3.8 million sequencing reads. And the, the bottom line is, I mean, you're free to look at these lots if you like. But the bottom line is that we can predict the rate of insertions and deletions entirely by looking at the total frequency of somatic mutations. In other words, there's nothing special about HIV broadly neutralizing antibody producers. There's nothing special about HIV infected individuals with regard to insertions and deletions. If you can tell me what their insertion, what their mutation frequency is, I can tell you what the insertion and deletion rate is. So the HIV infected individuals have their immune systems, their B-cell uh, arm, driven so hard that they have higher mutation rates, higher mutation frequencies, and as a result of that, we get higher insertion and deletion rates. Pretty simple, and thank goodness as a vaccinologist, because that means that all we have to do is drive somatic mutation, and the rest follows. But what exactly follows? Why do we have these insertions and deletions? Do they serve a purpose? And the answer is, I'm going to skip that, I'll skip that too. Um, the answer is that they do seem to serve a purpose, in this particular case, anyway. So I'm going to leave us with this final story. Um, if we look at the phylogram of the uh, antibodies here, these are the mature antibodies, and each of these, it boxed in blue, are sequences that we recovered through high throughput sequencing and synthesized in order to measure their properties. Now, you notice that this guy here, called 2GNM7S, is just off the main branch of lineage from the unmutated common ancestors to the mature antibodies, and uh, is the last antibody before this insertion deletion event. And here's what that insertion deletion event looks like for this particular clone. Um, there's the unmutated common ancestor, and here's one of the mature antibodies, and there's this, there's a six base deletion down here, and a 33 base insertion up here. And if you look carefully, you can see that this insertion is a copy of this region here. So it's a tandem duplication. 33 bases were duplicated and six bases removed. And it occurred, we found no antibodies, there are no genes that have one or not the other, so they probably occur very, very close to each other, if not in the same uh, individual. So we look at this gene, which is the 
last gene before, and that gene, which is the first gene after. And we make hybrids of the various combinations of uh, insertions and deletions and point mutations and so forth that represent the intermediates between these two. And we study their binding properties. And what we find, oh, this came out terrible, sorry about that. Let's, let's focus our attention on the on rate. So this is the rate at which the antibody antigen bind together initially. And you want that to be high. So starting at the, um, starting at, at this one, 2JSKAU, the on rate is, is shown here, and then the next one is the observed 2GMM7S, and then these two guys are the synthetic constructs that we made by just putting in the, the, the duplication. And by putting in the duplication, we've increased the on rate by a factor of 10. And so this, this one change has brought about a tenfold increase in uh, the on rate and has actually uh, also improved the off rate. Conversely, if we take the first gene after the insertion deletion event, and we take out the, du the duplications, we lose much more than tenfold. So the duplication was made, and then additional mutations uh, were incorporated that, it, so to speak, took advantage of the presence of that deletion. So taking away the deletion, uh, taking away the duplication now um, makes the antibody much worse. And similarly here for the off rate and the overall affinity. Bottom line, this particular event, this large scale insertion deletion event, was a crucial element of the development of high affinity for this antibody. And uh, I won't linger on this, but also for the development of neutralization capacity for a, a, a wide variety of different uh, viruses. So we're now trying to understand more clearly what the role is for insertions and deletions in somatic mutation and looking at a, a number of other systems as well in addition to HIV, influenza, and anthrax. And uh, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to talk about any of this. I just want to get through to the end so that I can uh, acknowledge all the folks that, that uh, worked on this over the last few years with us. At BU, Fang Fang is, a, uh, is now a junior faculty member who is a postdoc of mine at Duke. Kate Sawatsky is a graduate student. Reka Baskarabapa was a um, bioinformatician at Duke. A whole slew of people, but I'm going to I'm going to call out Bart Haynes, Larry Liao, Manir Alam, and Garnet Kelso in particular. At Stanford, Scott Boyd and Andrew Fire did the sequencing. Peter Harbour at Los Alamos National Labs um, did the rendering in beautiful violet and purple colors for that uh, non-phylogram. And of course we were sponsored by um, a number of, uh, of wonderful organizations, and in particular NIAID. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Why did you think that? I mean, generally speaking, the slower the operate is, the longer will be the residence time of the antibody to the target. True, but it has to get there first. And so we've now uh, we've now looked at, at the on rates and off rates for a, a lot of, of antibodies, and uh, we've seen both types of affinity maturation. Those driven by uh, increased on rates as well as those uh, increased by decreased off rates. So we are seeing both. 
Uh, I'm sorry? Oh, yes, 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 we do. So if you, if you model this particular gas that insertion, can you find out what really it's adding that really makes it a much better uh, scientific number? Yes, yes, and in fact, um, we've actually crystallized that uh, that con the, the antibodies and compared it to the structure of the unmutated ancestor. And frankly, it's very difficult to say. It's hard to look at and say why it has improved. We don't have a co-crystal uh, of, of these antibodies with GP120, which is what we really want. And it's doing more than HIV. It's also become better, better than the antibody, otherwise it's Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. Uh, the other virus was another strain of oh, HIV. Yeah, I'm sorry if I didn't make that clear. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much, Tom.